Hi, my name is Celine, I, and I'm your moderator for today. Uh, this webinar is organized by Science Media Center Malaysia, also known as SMC Malaysia, in collaboration with University of Malaysia Kelantan and Climate Action Malaysia, also known as KAMI. A little bit background, SMC Malaysia, uh, which I also co-founded, is an independent resource center under the auspices of uh, the Malaysian Biotechnology Information Center, also known as MABIC, and SMC Malaysia aims to provide uh, evidence-based information to support our local journalists to report uh, complex or controversial science issues, including COVID-19, that makes the headlines. And the topic for today, uh, obviously, uh, COVID-19 and climate change are real but very different health emergencies. Uh, we see that the novel coronavirus is a public health emergency caused by a new virus, SARS-CoV-2. And this has rapidly spread throughout communities all around the world. So meanwhile, we see climate change, conversely, uh, is a slow motion public health emergency aggravated by health crisis uh, associated with sudden events such as extreme weather and wildfire. So both of these emergencies are environmental origin and they point to the same thing, which is showing us that environment is one of our factors that affects our health. So to better understand this situation today, we are discussing in this webinar, the topic of climate change, COVID-19 and future pandemics. So before we start, let me introduce our panel of speakers for today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Sandy Chung, Deputy Dean, Academic and Student Development, Faculty of Veterinary, Veterin Veterinary Medicine, University of Malaysia, Kelantan, UMK. She's also an expert in wildlife uh, medicine with research interest in zoonotic diseases. Also, we have uh, Dr. Renat Tiu, Sustainability and Climate Change Advisor for Center for Governance and Field Studies. And we we have Eli Nadia Zufaka as Kami. Kami is a grassroots uh, climate uh, movement who also works closely with local communities such as Rasli's, which are often uh, most affected by environmental degradation and climate change. But first of all, let me address the question to uh, first our uh, Dr. Sandy first. Uh, so we know that um, around 75% of new infectious diseases are zoonotic, just like COVID-19. So some experts are, they, they even believe that climate change may be putting humans in closer contact with animals. But probably you can help us understand, first of all, what does it mean by zoonotic disease? And just briefly share with us, what were your experiences in dealing with them? Hi, Julian. Um, uh, and good afternoon to everyone that is attending, as well as the, the, the other two panelists, Dr. Siu and um, Nadia. So, um, so let's start with what is zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that can be transmitted from animals to humans and also uh, from humans to animals. And sometimes another term used is uh, anthropogenosis, but usually for us, genosis is enough. Um, and some of the medical profession might prefer to use the word do anthropogenosis to, to say to differentiate between the diseases that are transmitted from uh, human to animals. But anyway, um, transmission of diseases comes directly. So from uh, human contact with animals or their um, discharges, or we can uh, it can happen to a vector such as a mosquitoes or ticks, where they will carry uh, the disease from the animal um, in their body, and when they bite a human, that disease get transferred. So some examples that are very commonly known in Malaysia, such as rabies, is a virus. Uh, from that can be transmitted to human through bites. Okay. Um, another very um, common example in domestic cats, you can see the cats have a skin ulcer that don't heal for weeks or months. It's actually a sporotri uh, sporotri trichosis, which can infect humans. Um, 
than the famous Nipah virus. Obviously, we know about that. The outbreak in 1998-99, um, that caused um, 105 human fatalities. Millions of pigs were destroyed. And the economic cost, it came up to estimated to 300 to 450 million US dollars to the country. So um, um, the list can go on and on. It will take more than an hour just to talk about all sorts of diseases that we have. But the bottom line is zoonotic disease is very, we look, in, look at it very critically because not just it results in illness and sometimes death in humans, but it also causes um, severe economic impact on the industry. Um, so, and it impacts the country's um, in, um, input. So the GDP would be uh, affected quite severely. I think that is a uh, yeah. short introduction to zoonotic diseases. Yeah. Okay, so we know that uh, zoonotic disease is a disease that transfers from one species to another. And we mm -hmm. saw in uh, 2003, uh, South SARS outbreak came from yeah. civet, right? A wild cat. And in 2013, MERS in Saudi Arabia was spread by camels. Mm -hmm. So we can see that the, these coronaviruses are definitely within our radar. So did we or did we not expect this COVID-19 to happen? Um, you asked me, yes, I do. Unfortunately, I do feel that, um, I do, um, felt that after SARS, there could be something else coming up because the, the con uh, contact between humans and animals did not decrease and the uh, ac human activities did not change. There are continuous, um, animals being sold in the wet market. Perhaps not so much in Malaysia. But if you look at China, the, the wet market do sell all sorts of uh, species, um, which is quite worrying because it's the, it's the same scenario when SARS happened, where they, they thought that civets um, transmitted the disease or somehow there is a mix between the coronaviruses in, in human and civet. There's a slight mutation and it, it became something that um, dangerously infect human and could cause death. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I do foresee it, and in fact, it is quite surprising that it did not happen even earlier. And it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting that you brought up uh, with the wet markets as well, which we will uh, go into later about wildlife trade and also wet markets. Uh, but I want to follow up this story. I want, I want to ask the next question, however, uh, to probably Dr. Renat can help uh, answer this. Like. How, how interestingly during this pandemic, we've seen the news about you know the skies clearing up uh, in several highly polluted uh, cities. We hear about the waterways uh, in Venice Grand Canal and uh, clear waters now, and wildlife are like going back to their natural habitats. So the question is: Is it really what it seems, or also will this last? Yeah, um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Like, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so, I mean, some of the evidences that we are seeing in the en environment seems to have a very, very positive impact, as, as what you have pointed out, Sulin. Uh, you know, if you look at the air pollution index in Malaysia, it's definitely improved quite significantly. Um, I, I believe the number was uh, something like 65% of the uh, in indicators or uh, the air pollution index seems to provide a good positive reading in, in Malaysia during the lockdown period. And a lot of this has been attributed to the fact that, you know, we are traveling less, uh, there's less industrialization, so everything has more or less come to a halt. Um, in terms of carbon emissions as well, like we have been, you know, managed to sort of cut emissions down. Like in China, like uh, a report by Carbon Brief shows that about 25% of, of emissions have been reduced uh, literally dur during the lockdown period. Um, but the second half of the question that you've asked, whether this would last, um, I am doubtful at this point in time. Um, and it's partly because, you know, everyone is sort of moving towards that phase of, you know, wanting to recover. So after the lockdown period is done, everyone's going to go back to their old ways of doing things, like possibly ramping up uh, productivity, uh, you, you know, they're, they're going to start working, uh, you know, overtime just to catch up on lost 
uh, time and, and lost productivity, lost output. And this is a, a concern because what we will see at the end of the day is actually a, a spike in, in emissions. And also, uh, we see that, example, for example, uh, we don't try to connect to uh, how does climate change comes into the picture of the whole COVID pandemic because we see most epidemiologists uh, theorize that infectious diseases, including AIDS, Ebola, SARS, are the results of man's interaction uh, with the natural world. So we can help us uh, kind of see in this kind of big picture, where does this climate change come into this picture? And uh, in short, what's the connection between climate change and pandemics? Yeah, um, I would sort of offer two perspectives. So the first perspective is really what can we know in our current state, right? So uh, scientists and researchers have established a link that climate change affects you know, the spread of infectious diseases. So a case in point is that if you look at uh, the Aedes aegypti uh, mosquito breed, you know that it goes through this uh, metamorphosis cycle from you know, an egg to a larvae, pupae, and then to, uh, you, you know, an adult mosquito. So this breed has always ingested Zika, but um, before the incubation process of this virus is, is complete in the body of these mosquitoes, the mosquito would have died out. So, so it's actually harmless. But under warmer conditions, because of global warming and so on and so forth, uh, what we're seeing is that the incubation process of the virus in these mosquitoes will be completed. So the mosquitoes now actually tend to become harmful instead of harmless. So, so they become infectious. And this is just one of the many examples of uh, how you know, our species, uh, insects, animals, like, you know, are affected because of warmer conditions. And what has been really terrifying is that there are still so many unknowns, like there's still so much research that needs to be done in this space for us to establish the connection between climate change and how it impacts you know, uh, animals and, and, and what sort of repercussions this would have on human health, right? So, so this is really the first cluster. Uh, the second angle is really uh, what do we not know? And, and this has got to do with you know, the melting of uh, permafrost. So there's been this theory that has been put forth, right, by academicians that they are long dormant uh, bacteria and viruses uh, that, that has been tracked for centuries, like in ice and, and, and permafrost. And because of warmer conditions, because of the melting of glaciers, uh, there is a possibility that such viruses would resurface. And this is also a very terrifying scenario because we don't know much about these viruses that have been dormant for such a long time. Right. Thank you for the explanation. Probably later we'll go on to uh, discuss further on the repercussions of whether this COVID-19 is probably the rehearsal of what to come. But first, to go to Nadia, uh, oftentimes we see uh, the community most affected by climate change, um, indigenous community, right, uh, are mostly affected by climate change, especially now with COVID-19. is almost like a double whammy. So Nadia, you work with the indigenous community. What's the current situation on the ground right now? Okay. Um, hi, first and foremost. Hi, everyone. My name is Nadia. Uh, thank you, um, Sulin, for inviting me. So, um, uh, the, 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 what you say is completely correct. It's a double whammy for these communities, these frontline communities. Um, not only that they have faced um, uh, severe uh, environmental uh, violations and human rights violations for, for years, is long-standing, yeah? And um, with this uh, virus coming in, um, it affects them in a way that uh, we've never seen before because um, some of these um, indigenous people, they have, they, they've already have um, connections and contacts with the outside world. And um, they they have lost their lands, and they are start to rely to the the, the modern human economy. So um, um, in a way that they are much uh, very much in, uh, affected by this situation. And um, worse is because they have lack uh, um, education um, uh, in terms of also and healthcare quality healthcare services. 
and this uh, could be um, very, um, how do I say, um, this can exacerbate a situation, um, for example, something as simple as measles could decimate a uh, whole community. Uh, for example, what we saw uh, last year in Kuala Ko, uh, something that could have been, um, you know, um, avoided, uh, but that didn't happen. Um, I, I would like to add something that what Dr. Renat said just now um, about the, uh, the the how one of the impacts that I saw um, because uh, some of this information has been given to me by some of these uh, orang asli friends as well in terms of um, uh, from my perspective as a student uh, I studied that you know when uh, uh, climate change induces uh, um, the biogeographical uh, species. Uh, I mean, they, they change the biogeographical uh, distribution of species and we, we can already see the invasive species coming in, trying to find, you know, um, places, uh, trying to find favorable temperatures for them to, you know, to, to reproduce and such. And um, this is quite true. And some of the uh, Orang Asli has, has seen this. And um, it's um, really quite scary because uh, their voices are not being heard. Uh, their voices are not being, you know, uh, considered as, you know, um, you know, um, uh, stakeholders, uh, equal stakeholders in terms of uh, climate solutions, and this knowledge should be should be here out by the outside world. Yeah, and it's interesting that you brought up that point because I think, uh, like some people would say that you know climate change is intangible, right? It doesn't seem like that anymore, isn't it? And in your perspective, what do you think? Do you think the people's behavior will change as a result of this current pandemic? In ways that positively or negatively impact the environment, Nadia? Ooh. <laughs> That's quite an interesting question. Um, okay, um, I, I have my uh, my side, my good side is very optimistic, but I also have a realistic side of me saying that in the next, um, maybe in the next 10, 10, 20 years, we will see more and more uh, a, a, a frequent uh, incidences of this pandemic. Um, should we, um, uh, uh, still maintains the same business as usual um, uh, uh, productivity modes of production but I think that should there would be an, uh, a really uh, awesome policy intervention by the government not only the Malaysian government but globally then we could see um, you know situations and pandemics and uh, also global uh, catastrophe, uh, climatic events, biodiversity loss, all this could be lessened. Um, but this uh, cannot happen without the people having the awareness to do so. And Malaysians uh, have very um, low uh, environmental and also climate literacy, and that needs to change. Yeah. Okay, on that note, I would like to actually launch a poll, which I was supposed to do early on, but never mind. So with this poll, I would like to uh, ask uh, the attendees, um, what do you think? Is climate change um, as serious a crisis as coronavirus? Take your answer, yes, no, or not sure. And we will further discuss this uh, later on with panelists. If you will give a few more seconds. Okay, so we see the results here, which I will show on the screen um, for those who are attending us on the Zoom uh, webinar. Uh, the result is, yes, 94% uh, actually uh, agree that climate change is as serious a crisis as coronavirus, uh, Well, 2% is no, and 4% says not sure. Um, Having said that, I would like to go back to uh, Dr. Sandy uh, to kind of like help us kind of like uh, understand this further because we see that, for example, in 1998, the Nipah virus, uh, Nipah outbreak, as you mentioned, um, we know that it's linked to uh, fruit bats, correct? And also, why, how the, the, the habitats were, how were these fruit bats displaced was due to partly with the slash and burn de uh, deforestation to make way for industrial planting, uh, pushing the bats into areas with pig farms. And also we can also trace, for example, uh, another example, the AIDS pandemic can be traced back to its roots to the butchering of chimpanzees in forested areas in Central Africa. So in your point of view, how human impact on the environment makes pandemic more likely? 
All right, let's start with the Nipah virus um, outbreak. So through um, extensive um, epidemiological studies, we found that the reason that the fruit bats were attracted to the um, orchards in the pig farm because the, there was a long extensive period of dry and hot uh, season and there was a serious um, forest fire. So that kind of um, led to the loss of their habitat and food source. So obviously, I mean, for survival, they went out and looked for further food, food source. And at that time, pig farm practices um, multiple income um, practice. So they have a fish pond, they have the pig farms and also the orchards, which run uh, quite well because the fertilizers and all that. Um, so, but unfortunately for us, when the fruit bats come to the orchards, uh, the orchards are relatively near to the pig farms, uh, the pigs, where, the, the, where they are kept. Um, so the saliva discharges and feces unfortunately uh, contaminated the pigs. So they may have uh, eaten it un uh, unintentionally. And pigs are excellent amplifier hosts. That is in the meaning um, that viruses rap rapidly replicate in their body, so um, the pigs were sick, um, and that in consequently infected the farmers and the workers. So this is um, the chain of uh, event that happened for the Nipah virus. Um, and as like, uh, as you said, like AIDS, um, it was suspected also that there is a mutating um, virus that came from the non-human primates. So in some countries. Um, they do practice bush meat uh, consumption. So when the animal is captured, obviously it's really stressed out. Um, then there's the butchering, so uh, the hu people are exposed to raw um, meat, the organs of the animals. Okay, so it for some of these viruses, even though they are infective to people, they may not have been infective uh, or disease causing in animals. So they are carrying, these animals are carrying the viruses in the body, but they are relatively healthy in a, in a sense, right? So you don't see clinical sciences, they are not sick, but when it gets uh, mutated and in fact humans, yeah, that became a different story altogether. So yes, so when uh, when human has a, um, I can say sort of like almost unnatural uh, contact with uh, wild animals, that kind of increase the risk of uh, um, a disease infection. So like in SARS, um, like as you said, it came from a vivid uh, family, vivid day. So they are not uh, considered as cats, cats, feline, they are vivid days. Um, this is similar thing that came in because there is a mixture of uh, pathogens from all multiple species that may have result in the mutated viruses that is so deadly and dangerous to people. And um, also, do you agree with what uh, Dr. Renat uh, was uh, saying that uh, could climate change may be putting mm -hmm. uh, humans in even closer contact with animals? Yes, I do agree with Dr. Uh, Renat uh, when he mentioned about mosquitoes. So right now we've uh, Global warming, uh, mosquitoes are, may have a longer lifespan. We, we don't, do not have that uh, rapid cold weather that could just stop their life cycle. So there are people that has never been um, uh, exposed to this, um, uh, this pathogen. So like for us in the tropical countries, mosquitoes are all year round. So in a way we are like, being immunized because we, are, we got bitten by mosquitoes and all that. So in a way, we, you get small little doses of these pathogens and we don't get sick, but we get immunized through it. Um, but if the, the viruses mutated, that's a different story. But you in temperate countries, there are huge uh, naive populations that have never encountered these viruses and they would easily get infected and may uh, end up with a quite uh, severe vehicle uh, um, outcomes. Also, you mentioned yeah. earlier in your in your answer earlier that 
uh, when I asked whether do we see COVID-19, uh, uh, do we expect it to happen? And you mm -hmm. said, unfortunately, yes. So, mm -hmm. so at this point of time, what have we learned or not learned from previous infectious diseases like SARS, MERS, and Nipah virus? Um, right. Um, from the Malaysians' uh, perspective, um, I would say that we do not have such a high risk in terms of uh, um, from uh, wildlife trades and selling in the wet market because a lot of our um, animals locally and internationally is covered, totally protected under the Wildlife uh, Conservation Act 2010. That's the Malaysian Act. So um, a lot of the species are not allowed to be consumed, caught, uh, kept, sold openly. Um, unlike in China. So in a way, also the population are not so uh, keen on eating um, exotic meats, not as much as we compared to other countries. So we are still very much eating chickens, beef, pork, and that sort of uh, mean domestic uh, livestock. Um, so in a way that we may not run that uh, the risk of from wet markets, but Contact with wildlife that undeniably we do have a lot of that. So um, illegal wildlife trades, it's quite rampant. We can even see sales being uh, offered on social media. Um, we have um, uh, poaching um, happening. We also have, we do have legal uh, hunters um, that able to hunt a few uh, species such as the wild boar and all that. So, um, and there are, we are not doing enough research to find out what does all these animals carry actually. Because um, any research, um, however basic it may seem, it does carry a lot of uh, um, financial um, inputs because um, and uh, these are unlike dogs and cats, you can just call them, they'll come to you, we can collect samples easily. So this is actually quite a big operation, you need to capture them and hopefully not harm them. We have to, we have to think about from the animal welfare point of view as well. So we, we can't just go out and catch whatever we like and just do research. So there's a lot of uh, consideration and we do need a lot more uh, research to find out exactly what does our wildlife carries and what are the risks that they pose to the general public. So because people do go in for recreational purposes, there are people that go in for harvesting, logging, collecting fruits, herbs and all that. So I, and especially the indigenous people, I think that they are very much uh, at risk to all sorts of uh, genetic diseases that, came, that could come from the wildlife species. Okay, so we see we have uh, kind of established, uh, it takes a lot of effort, right? Establish the links between climate change and COVID-19 and, and uh, future pandemics. And also maybe the second question, the following questions I would like to pose to Dr. Rina and also Nadia. You know, there's a saying that if only climate change can be communicated as well as COVID-19 pandemics. What are your thoughts? Maybe uh, Dr. Rina would like to start first? Sure. Um, I think for those who have work in the climate change space, we know for a fact that it's laden with uh, multiple jargons, you know, UNFCCC, GHG, IPCC, uh, GCFD, uh, so much so that, you know, when I was reviewing an article, like just in one paragraph, I found, you know, like 10 different abbreviations that might not be familiar to a lay person. So I think a lot of conversations that we have in this space uh, tend to be 30,000 feet above ground, like when we start you know, describing the technicalities that, that, that are involved or even different types of climate policies that have been enacted by, by, by different countries, comparing and contrasting them. Um, to, to a certain extent, I think this sort of becomes a barrier in terms of reaching out to a lay person who may not necessarily have uh, the know-how or even the background knowledge of, of what climate change is or how does that impact uh, him or, or his own lifestyle. It tends to scare like people away because there's just so much it's, it's like there's a plethora of information that's that's just being thrown out at, at them um i think that's a term for it i think we call it a uh, infodemic like where there's just excessive amount of, of information uh about a certain problem that you kind of get lost 
in translation. You don't know where to start. And and for us, really, I think I think the uh, strategy here is really to you, you know like come up with, with something really cohesive. Uh, perhaps a framework to see how we can tailor our messages to specific audiences. And, and may, maybe this is not just something for climate change, but also, you know, across multiple science disciplines, where a lot of experts and researchers, they're no doubt very good in, in their area of expertise, but how do they then uh, sort of trigger that, that sort of message, uh, things that they want to convey to help a lay person, right? Like uh, your, your magic kia and, and whatnot, you know, to help them understand uh, you know, the, the pandemic or crisis at, at stake. And I think we, we need to sort of shift towards that, that angle a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And also uh, for Nadia, what do you think? Because I know Kami uh, is an NGO who's been driving this message of climate change. What do you think, uh, how do you compare with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in terms of how is it being communicated? The, 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 the amount of uh, mm -hmm. urgency uh, regarding this uh, pandemic? Um, before before I like to answer that, I like to comment on what uh, Dr. Sandy said uh, previously about the indigenous people are much more perceptible to zoonotic diseases. Um, uh, I had the same um, inclination first, uh, I mean as well. But uh, when I learned through all the um, some of their cultural traditions, um, they do not eat that much of meat or bush meat. They eat. Uh, mostly, um, uh, they are mostly vegetarian, uh, but they only eat meat once in a while uh, if they have like a karayaan or something like that. And um, they also have a, a different different tribes have different traditions in, in what kind of meat they should eat and is it a good quality meat? Is it a good condition to eat them as well? They they have this um, knowledge that is not shared with the outside world. So so. Uh, if, if they they've already lived with these animals you know with, with, with in, in this habitat for such a long time and there are very little stories of, of zoonotic diseases infecting the indigenous people uh, even in uh, in the amazons but what we're seeing we are seeing right now these zoonotic uh, you know uh, jumps are happening in places like millions of miles away and then it came to you know to, for example to the amazonians by um, you know by the the people coming in um, uh, to to deforest and such uh, is quite um, I, I don't know it's it's quite crazy to see that to happen and they don't get the diseases from the animals around them but from animals uh, you know millions of miles away so yeah to answer your question uh, yeah I um, yeah I do agree with what Dr Rena is saying uh, it's um, um, the 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 climate um, not literacy the the climate discourse in Malaysia. Um, has very much taken in a very um, urban narrative and also it's mostly in English. I think um, that is one of the reasons why when we first, out, uh, we, we first started out, we wanted to do it in Basa Melayu uh, because we would reach uh, uh, the, the, the communities that is, um, you know, has always been isolated, marginalized, uh, especially people like you know the the rural rural folks the the, um, the indigenous people who are the front lines of this you know uh, this double whammy like you mentioned um, I also think that there is a very urgent um, uh, action to be taken to humanize this is the peril that I see like dengan COVID um, to humanize this crisis you know using all these visuals um, this video um, I think for people to understand better I mean the younger people nowadays they understand the better through visuals they have very short attention span you do like a bite-sized video berapa minute five minutes and then they can share it you know, uh, I think that's the fastest way to get them to understand. I mean, sure, they will not get as much. Sure, some of the information, the climate science, the complex information might be oversimplified, but you started something. And when we started something, it might grow if you continue to do that. Yeah, that's, that's all. Yeah. And on that note, do you think that um, with COVID-19, is it, uh, it is putting the climate change agenda on hold? Or how will in your view, COVID-19 help us to deal with our climate crisis? Nadia? Oh, I think, oh, I think this is quite a complex question. Uh, okay, so um, I think the, the COVID-19 has definitely uh, gives, gives us a um, glimpse of how the world could have been, you know, um, if we, were, we, we, we continuously, you know, um, 
destroy and and uh, degrade our um, you know our habitat and our you know harmony with living with our natural habitat it's it's crazy but um, I think the the question of um, the the climate crisis um, initiatives efforts by all uh, the big organizations that you mentioned Dr. Renat um, although um, some of their papers, some of their um, conventions are, um, you know, have been shifted. But the question, the 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 negotiations between governments and all this can um, must be continued. It cannot stop because, uh, like you said, um, this uh, COVID nineteen is just the first cluster. You know, climate change is a far bigger uh, situations that will impact. Uh, you know. Um, uh, the the normal sectors in our lives um, we already seen that already happening right now with the you know with uh, the, the the erratic um, weather uh, climate uh, i mean erratic weather hot extreme temperatures right now we're seeing that in the northern parts of malaysia and even in vietnam where rice uh, production has has um, you know has gone down so uh, this is another major food security water security issue that is going to Hit us, you know, without us knowing it. We know it, but you know, we're not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. And also, maybe uh, back to Dr. Renat as well. As you said, the if the communication when it comes to uh, publicizing about climate change is so fully laden with uh, jargons, as you said. But how do you think with this uh, COVID nineteen pandemic? How do you think it can help us to deal with our climate crisis? Yeah, um, you, you know, you know, it's quite interesting when you know the, the COVID nineteen pandemic sort of unfolded. One of the things that I have been sort of fighting for is that I think the framing of COVID nineteen is primarily as a health emergency, but I think the narrative should be that it needs to be framed as a planetary health emergency, because and, and that narrative is important because if we don't get it right, what you will see is that people will just be looking at it purely from a health care perspective. So they are firefighting, trying to put out fires, trying to get, you know, things like PPEs, uh, food security, uh, very short-term uh, solutions to tackling, you know, the, the pandemic. So they don't go down, you know, a step further to look at what has actually caused COVID-19 in terms of uh, deforestation, in terms of, you know, the illegal wild, wildlife trade that has been happening, which I think it's absolutely important for us to move action in that space. So, so I, I think, you know, that sort of narrative and communication that needs to sort of get through to, to the whole world on a global basis, as well as how important it, it is, right, to look after the, the environment. And, and we, it's something that we have to continue advocating for, because as it stands, I think there's just not enough urgency to, to treat uh, the climate crisis with, with the same level of urgency that, that we're doing with COVID-19. And, and to a certain extent, as sad as, as it is, like I have to say that, you know, I'm sort of seeing climate action, you know, taking a step back instead of moving forward. As you have alluded to earlier, uh, Sulin, that there are big conferences that have been pushed back. Uh, COP26, which was supposed to happen in Glasgow at the end of this year, has been moved to next year. And there are countries that have actually, you know, like uh, come up to the fore asking if they can actually, you, you know, get a permit to delay uh, their, their, the NDCs that, that they've committed themselves to. It's the uh, reduction in, in, in emissions footprint, which I think shouldn't be the case. Because if anything, we should look at COVID-19 really as an opportunity a golden opportunity, in fact, for us to uh, rethink the way that we do things, to adopt, you know, systems thinking, to, you know, like move investments to its uh, a green renewable economy. We shouldn't go back to our normal way of doing things uh, because, you know, you know, as I've mentioned, normal was precisely the problem as to why all of this started. So, so we cannot go back to, to, to the old, old state. And, and the more that we delay, like what you're going to see from the private sector, from governments are basically excuses. They are just gonna say, oh, you know, like we're, we're, we're so busy firefighting, uh, you know, with COVID-19 that there's just no opportunity for us to rethink, like how to redo things. And, and, and that's very sad because, uh, you, you know, there's a saying that if you only have, if all you have is just a hammer 
everything else looks like a nail to you. And I think that's really the trap that we have fallen into. You know, we're so used to our old ways of doing things, our old habits that we refuse to move the needle. We refuse to change. And, and for me, that's disappointing. Right. And yeah, we will uh, we'll go on further to discuss this on moving forward. How can we uh, leverage on the climate change agenda and such. Uh, but I'd like to go back to Dr. Sandy, uh, where we see, we talked about a lot so far about uh, wildlife trade and wet markets, uh, as, as well as uh, how, uh, you know, human, it increases uh, human and animal uh, interaction. Uh, also, interestingly, we see that the, the wet market that was in China, where it was first reported, the infection, uh, those markets were initially closed for general lockdown. Uh, but now as the pandemic is easing in China, they're all returning to life, including this market that was first uh, linked to the reported infection. So how do you see this whole situation here, Dr. Sandy? And clearly you have already addressed the implication of wildlife trades and uh, wet markets. So how do you see moving forward? What can we, what can we do uh, to take action like what Dr. Rena was saying in terms of uh, tackling the wildlife, uh, wildlife trade? Yeah. Right. Um, okay. um, just very quickly before I answer your question. So I'm not um, regarding Nadia's comment just now. So I'm not saying that the indigenous people are at risk of illnesses because um, people that have been constantly being exposed to the possible um, pathogens, they are kind of immunized. Just that it's just like the wildlife species sometimes that we rescue because I, I used to work with the wildlife department and we rescued uh, animals that was trapped or um, isolated or displaced. Once they come to captivity, a lot of them don't survive because they, they, when they're in the wild, they have the pathogens with them, and but it is in a balance. But once they are stressed, then they will fall sick. So that is a worry that we have on the wildlife species as well as, well as the indigenous people. They are at risk in a way that they are being exposed, but if there's any disruption to their daily life, there is possibility of uh, higher risk of uh, illnesses. So um, now Go back to your um, questions, like uh, just like SARS, once the outbreak has been uh, kind of resolved or uh, reduced, um, human activity went back, went back to what it was before, thinking that oh, it's us, we are not that worried about it anymore. So um, as you asked me about what we learned from SARS, MERS and Nipah virus, especially Nipah virus, so after Nipah virus, we uh, so uh, we, we finally realized we, we can't work in silo. So like the uh, Ministry of Health, the Department of Veterinary Services, um, the Municipal Council, the State Government and all that, we can't work on our own. So we have to come together. So that's why like, in the new millennium, um, this uh, One Health approach has been uh, um, initiated and very much uh, involved by all parties. So like uh, currently, if you know the National Security Council, the MKM, so they have the, obviously the Ministry of Health, you have the uh, Department of Veterinary Services, DBS. Um, you also have the uh, Ministry of Transport, the Ministry of Ener Energy, Science, Technology, Environment and Climate Change. So very appropriate for today's uh, topic. Um, even Ministry of Education, because we are trying to educate the younger generation that, hey, we are not just talking about human, we're just not talking about animals. The environment is very important as well. And climate change is happening as whether you want to ignore it or you, you realize about it, it is happening and it is affecting us. Um, besides that, the, all the federal ministries, we, you see that the military are involved, the police are involved, uh, the royal police are involved in, in the roadblocks. So in, in a case of outbreaks, you need to stop people from coming in, going out. Um, transport of uh, livestock even, if let's say it's a zoonotic disease, like in Nipah viruses uh, outbreak, the movement of animals has to be stopped. In fact, um, livestock are not supposed to move across the state border. Even in normal circumstances, you're not allowed to move without a permit. So um, that's something maybe a lot of people doesn't know. Okay. Um, besides that, uh, then we have the local authorities like the municipal council, the, the villages, uh, village heads and all that. So this is when, when we want to change something, we need uh, not just 
authorities. We still need the local people to be involved. And so not just scientists, like scientists like us, we may not know how to talk to the lay person. Some, some may be carried uh, away with uh, bombastic words and they don't, they don't get to the grassroots. So we need the social sciences as well. So they understand how people behave, uh, how, what can make changes, what, what, can, uh, what kind of a message can we pass to them to say like, hey, this is important. I have to do something. I better do something before something worse happens. Um, so this one help initiative, we have the uh, NSE, we have the Interministerial Committee for Control of Zoonotic Diseases. So there are work being done, although not as fast as you want, but works are being done. Initiative is, uh, is being made. And we have a, a Malaysian One Health University Network, Maya Hood, which is, which is under the umbrella of Sia Hood, uh, South Asia. Uh, we are working uh, among the eight universities and five government agencies to educate the current One Health workforce and the future One Health workforce so that this will carry on. Uh, further, and so with with these initiatives and all this co collaboration and cooperation between uh, different parties, Malaysia has been able to respond much much more faster and effectively compared to what we did during NIPA. A uh, very good uh, example is like the rabies uh, outbreak in the northern states and the uh, avian influenza outbreak. It was uh, controlled relatively fast. Uh, in a way, in the in a way that COVID nineteen was also handled quite well, if you can say, compared to many countries uh, in the world. So okay. uh, that that's the the scenario that we have now for Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And so we 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 we've heard from uh, Dr. Sandy about yeah how about the Nipa outbreak and also uh, what uh, our previous experience uh, what we have learned or not learned from SARS or MERS, but, and now we have COVID-19. So uh, this might be quite a big question to ask, but how do we reduce the risk of future outbreaks? If you can have, give us a few pointers on that. All right, um, okay. So um, I think not for the first thing, the change in human behavior is important. We have to, like right now we have a new norm having to be uh, socially distanced, uh, having to put on masks whenever we go out. We can't have mass gathering. Even the schools and the, the, the universities are complete lockdown. We are having online meeting like right now. We have, I'm having uh, online classes with my, with my students. Um, like for my students, because they are bad students, they, they need the skills, the, the, the hands-on. Unfortunately, we can't do anything now. Um, so we are given, given a lot of... Uh, hands out uh, videos, I mean, but hopefully because of, um, when they do come back, there's a lot of measures that we need to take and need to do. Um, that's one. Um, then a one health approach will be very important at this point. We will have to look at the impact, not just uh, the human activities, especially on animals and the uh, environment. Um, we have to learn how to respect the environment because I think modern uh, human has been really um, exploiting the, the resources from Mother Earth and to a point that we may not realize that in eventually, consequently, it, we will uh, um, damage our own uh, livelihood in the, in the long run or even our, the next generation to say. Um, people need to um, be educated and understand the risks and threats of uh, contact with uh, wildlife species and the fact that they want to own exotic pets. Do they know where the pets come from? Is it legal? Is it not? Because illegal pets, they can be just harvested from the jungle. And are they, uh, if the animals are hardy enough, they survive the um, being captured, being uh, transported, and being handled. Uh, if they are hardy enough to survive, how healthy are they by the time they reach to the hand of the potential owners? Okay. And um, and to take out all these uh, wildlife species, um, for somebody that's living in the city, it might not, they might not feel it. I mean, what does it mean to me to lose a few tigers, to lose a few uh, pangolins or snakes or whatever? I mean, to them, it's, it's nothing. 
but I see it as a, when we cause an imbalance in the ecosystem, um, the bad news is going to come back to us eventually. How is it going to come back to us? I, I don't know. But like for this, in this case, the, like SARS and COVID, maybe it's a warning sign from, from Mother Earth saying like, hello, we shouldn't, uh, we, we cannot continue like this. <laughs> um, so um, that's what I think. Like we have to really change how we approach this, uh, all these climate issues and environmental issues. Yeah, and I, I especially like how you've uh, mentioned, Doctor, that we have to learn how to respect the environment. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, maybe the, uh, Dr. Renat could help us uh, and this, uh, give us your opinion. Because when we see, while we see right now saving lives and you know, rebooting the economy are like the two utmost priorities for government to consider to, 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 when developing, like, for example, post-COVID-19 stimulus packages, what about the environment? Yeah, I, actually, that's a really, really good uh, question. So even with the whole lockdown scenario on a global basis that's happening you know, currently, we are only seeing or observing a 5% decrease in global emissions. And this stems primarily from you know, like human inactivity, where everyone is staying at home, they're not traveling as much. To achieve you know, the goals or targets of the Paris Agreement, we actually need to achieve 7.6% decrease in emissions. What this suggests to us is that apart from this change in behavior, right, we also need actually a revamp of our economies. And so this goes back to your question earlier about economic uh, stimulus packages. So one of the things that a group of environmentalists, myself included, what we have done was through the Club of Rome, we had a call like to all governments to not just give out economic stimulus packages um, as a free pass. We, we sort of fight for and say that it needs to come with certain conditions. Uh, corporations who are receiving any sort of bailouts need to set ambitious commitment targets as to how they intend to cut down their emissions uh, that are carbon footprint in the next five to 10 years. And, and this is actually important, but very sadly, we're not seeing that happening in this part of the world. There's no mentioning whatsoever in, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, or, or anything at all, right? Like on the environment alone. So stimulus packages are literally just given out unconditionally, which is disappointing. But yet, I suppose a, a slight glimmer of hope is that I know in Canada, uh, uh, Justin Trudeau, like declared that you know they will actually type in their relief aid like with uh, climate action. Seventeen ministers from the European Union has also stepped up to say that they want to move into that direction. So hopefully we'll be seeing more of that happening in such developed countries. But sadly we're, we're still lagging, you know, very very far behind. And I think this is also important to to mention that um, there was a study that was published by Oxford University, like where top British and American economists have claimed that massive investments in, in green uh, public programs, investment in renewable energy and so on and so forth, actually has a faster rate of return compared to traditional uh, stimulus packages that, that have been given. And, and I think that that's really an important point to make because a lot of people tend to think that investments in, in, in the green economy, you know, takes, it takes a much longer time to, to, for us to recoup our investments, that is no longer true. There's actually empirical evidence that proves otherwise. And maybe, uh, Nadia, would you like to add to that uh, in terms of, for example, how, do, uh, now, although now with the COVID-19 crisis, how KAMI is, uh, will play a role in terms of still sending out the message of, hey, let's not forget about the environment, let's not forget about climate change amidst all this whole uh, you know, crisis management uh, to you know, give out more stimulus packages, and more of like the the priority. What should be given? What should be given priority during this crisis? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, first of all, I like the um, to applaud <laughs> Dr. Renard for such awesome points over there. You speak about you know policy uh, that is backed by science. Um, then again, this is Malaysia. <laughs> I, I like to, um, uh, for example, I like to give an example of uh, the CFS, the Central uh, uh, Forest Mine Project in Malaysia that has been there for like uh, more than a decade now. And uh, it's still there, it's still not moving. Um, 
I think although the 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 whole thing was uh, very backed by science, they use um, um, a lot of different kinds of uh, methodologies uh, to to get that particular you know uh, report going on. But it it's not moving, and I think one of the biggest uh, problems that we have in Malaysia is the um, political inaction, a uh, lack of political will in in moving these uh, policies, uh, make or, or, or emphasizing uh, environment. Uh, in Malaysia, but then environment has always been a political mileage by politicians as well. Um, you know, they've used this to, to win elections and such, but it's always at, at that level. It has never gone beyond that. And I think we have seen these are the same politicians that has been failing in the pandemic, the same as they've been failing on the climate, you know, policy side. Uh, we need policymakers who, has, who understand this kind of risks and um, you know, uh, to do that, we need massive lobbying. And um, um, right now, with the current uh, COVID nineteen situation and also the uh, the change of the new government, we are very unsure and very uncertain of where um, the the new um, uh, uh, the, the new whatever uh, new policies or old policies are, are they going to be reenacted? Are they going to be um, amend or, or something like that we we don't know and uh, there hasn't been any clear instructions or any clear uh, papers uh, coming out from the government and such uh, it's very troubling for people who has been working on this for ages and um uh, that, that goes to show that uh you know it's it's very hard uh, working in conservation uh, <laughs> um world in malaysia where rnd is little uh you know, activists are constantly being bombarded every time. Uh, I really hope that what Kami can do in the next um, few months is to amplify um, the the these issues in a uh, in a very uh, visual way uh, for that uh, the the younger generations who would pick this up. Um, I think one of the the questions that we have to ask is that who's going to you know all the work that's being done by you amazing scientists yeah who who's going to pick that that up it's going to be the young people and they have to be prepared for it and so far they are going to be uh, you know unemployed in the future and going to face a lot of different other stresses in life and uh, I'm I'm afraid that um, the, the young would be too tired to to fight yeah I think. Um, uh, we need to do more in, in giving them motivation to do something. Yeah. Great. And I think we are kind of running out of time. If uh, possible, I'd like to wrap up uh, by just a few more other questions. Um, basically, uh, I think Dr. Renat has tweeted something quite interesting. Prelude to this webinar is, is COVID-19 a dress rehearsal for what is to come? This I need to hear from Dr. Renat. <laughs> well, I mean, for... I, I mean, a short and simple answer is yes, and possibly even even worse. I think I think we are facing we are living in unprecedented times, right? So COVID nineteen is is just a, a taste of what life could potentially be, right? And, and and it might get worse, you know. Like as I mentioned earlier, you know, with permafrost uh, melting, you have new viruses that are surfacing. Um, it, it could be worse. It could be something that we might have to live with. Like and, and and you know for many many years to to come, and you know we have no one to blame except for ourselves. So if we don't change our ways right now, you, you know things are gonna get get worse. And this is let, let me remind everyone that this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have not seen the worst yet. And Dr. Sandy, what do you think? Do you think uh, you agree with doc, what Dr. Renat say? And what do you think? Yeah, what, what about what is it the probably a dress rehearsal or like a prelude or what is to come in future pandemics? Um, well, for myself, I thought I would always have a, a thought behind my mind. Would there be one day like at least half of the human population will be wiped out by something? <laughs> and like, we are kind of looking, seeing something that's happening uh, that's quite similar. Like we have seen so many movies and the world coming with all sorts of uh, um, scenarios may it be a natural disaster or a, a viral diseases, and yeah, we are seeing it right now. I mean, currently we 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 still are able to um, treat some of the infected people. Um, in fact, the fat uh, fatality rate is actually relatively low. 
although the number of infected people are, are so, so high, uh, compared to some diseases like Ebola, Nipah, I mean, their uh, mortality rate is above 50%. And what if we are hit with something like that, then like we are just lost. So yeah, there is a possibility that we might have something even worse coming. So um, I don't know if with the, whatever that we do right now, be able to um, stop or at least mitigate what could, have, could be coming soon. I hope so. Like we, we really have to sit down and uh, act very quickly, and not just come up with policies uh, and policies and just paper on work and uh, tragic plan for the next five years. I mean, we have something that have to work, start working right now instead of the next five years. Mm -hmm. And Nadia, what do you think? Maybe just a wrap up. Uh, for example, Doctor Sandy mentioned something. A very uh, my favorite quote that is, uh, it, what COVID-19 has taught us is that we need to respect the environment. So Nadia, what, what do you think COVID-19 has taught us about the environment and climate change? Well, I think uh, Dr. Sandy and Renard has pretty much uh, made all the points. <laughs> um, but I, I, I just want to point out this. I, I'm going to send, send a message to all the young people just taking this platform. Lah. Um, to all my young you know, comrades, I would call you guys, um, we cannot, you know, we cannot give up. You know, I know that we're going to face a really difficult future, um, but we have to keep Keep, keep on believing, we have to keep the hope up, we have to be hopeful. And when I say be hopeful, we have to move things in action as well. We cannot just, you know, be an alarmist or be, you know, um, you know we tell all these stories of, of really uh, terrible things, but we do not move this into a tangible action. We have to do something, do it. You have your superpowers, some of you are really great in, in write up, you write. Some of you are really great in, in acting, in producing videos, do that. You know, capture the people's, you know, um, the people's uh, hope, uh, the people's uh, suffering, and then you, you, you translate it into something that is more meaningful and understandable for the, for the policy makers to, to, to do something about it. Yeah, I think that's pretty much what I want to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists who has been uh, given us brilliant, brilliant uh, response to understanding, uh, you know, more on COVID-19 in the context of, of climate change and future pandemics. But in my uh, view, I think what is clear is that what COVID-19 has shown us actually is how amazingly quick we can change our behavior when we really want to. And once this is finally over, hopefully we can take our newfound abilities and work together on larger crises like climate change and the environment. And with that, uh, that's the only time we have for this webinar. We shall see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.